It's January 28th, 2018. It's been, well, we've, we had a much longer winter hiatus than planned, but we are back. That means the Knee Jerks, Detroit Sports Talk of Eno and Big Al, are back on the air. I am the uh, co-host, along with Greg Eno, longtime uh, blogger and podcaster based out of Detroit, Al Beaton. And as I said, Greg Eno, longtime blogger and podcaster himself. He'll tell you where to find all his information. Greg, we have a big show, but good Lord, it's been a long time. I had to do like a mental checklist to even remember how to do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a long time, Alex. December 17th, to be exact. Uh, we, of course, we had New Year's Eve there, and then I got sick again. I was sick in December. I got sick again in January. I went to San Diego, and it almost killed me. Uh, so that was the 14th, and here we are now on, on January 28th. When you do these shows every other week, you miss you miss one or two. It's it's You're right. It seems like you, you, you haven't done it forever. Uh, fortunately, not, <clears throat> not a lot better. There wasn't a lot of really hard breaking news in the past four or five weeks. The Lions are still waiting to hire their coach, and the Pistons and the Red Wings aren't really setting the world on fire. We'll talk about all that. But uh, we do have a special guest uh, tonight, uh, a gentleman who has been gracious enough to reschedule for us twice now. Yes, uh, I feel Paul, bad for him. <laughs> I know. Paul, Paul Sweeney of uh, Stadium Journey is an old friend of ours, and uh, uh, I think the fact that he is an old friend of ours uh, gave us a little bit of leeway to, for him to indeed yeah. – uh, work with us a little bit. Paul's going to join us and talk about his new, uh, gosh, he's got a new website. He's got a new podcast. He's, he just came out with the 100 best uh, sports venues to, to watch games at. He's got, we got lots to talk about. Paul will do that in a little bit. I am Greg, you know, of course, from my, my WordPress blog, Out of Bounds. You can uh, search me there and also uh, my Winged Wheeler uh, hockey blog, also on WordPress. Um, so you can check me out there. Follow me on Twitter at Greg, you know, follow the uh, Knee Jerks on Twitter. At the Knee Jerks, our Facebook fan page is facebook.com slash the Knee Jerks. We also have a Knee Jerks group on Facebook as well. Um, we've got, again, lots to talk about um, as things are starting to heat up now in Detroit sports. And we got Paul Sweeney uh, later. But before we do any of that, we're going to play a game that we like to call Whose Birthday Is It Maestro? Uh, this is a game that everybody knows how we play by now. I give Al a clue or two or three of an individual whose birthday it is today in the world of sports. And if Al can correctly guess that person when the, within the first two clues, he will receive, and follow me here on this one, Al, you're mm -hmm. going to receive a depiction of the baseball winter meetings via color forms. <laughs> Yes, I remember so color forms. So there'll, be a little Al, Al, there'll be a little Al Avila <laughs> color form and a little, a bunch of... Ex Baseball executives, and you can change their outfits, and that'll be kind of fun for you. Yeah, so that'll sticky things. will have a little diorama almost. Oh my goodness! That's right. Colorful. Diorama. Jesus Christ! Right. Uh, yeah, be like <laughs> I'm six again. <laughs> All um, right, firewood. This person out. <clears throat> excuse me. This person uh, made his name in the world of hockey. I will tell you that he made his name as a player. Uh, he was born on this date in 1943. He is still alive. He's 75 years old today. Um, I will tell you that he used to play for the Red Wings, uh, among other teams. I will also tell you that he was part of a big blockbuster trade uh, that involved the Red Wings back in the late 60s. And I will also tell you that he was a um, um, – well, I think I'll stop there. I've got a good clue for clue, too, but I'll stop there. 75 years old, was a Red Wing, big blockbuster trade in 68, where he came to, uh, went from Detroit to another team. All right, there's a couple guys that come to mind. Uh, uh, first one I'm going to try is it Frank Mahavlich. No, good guess, though. I think, Mahavlich, I think I know the other one, then, but I'll have to yeah, look Mahavlich was down. part of that trade. I think uh, you, you know what the trade is. You know, yeah. you know, Frank is... A little bit older than, than this gentleman, but yeah, yeah. good guess. Uh, well, we'll get uh, clue two uh, after we talk to Paul Sweeney. All right, so let's get this underway. Greg, uh, introduce Paul, and let's start talking stadiums. Paul Sweeney uh, has been doing the knee jerks off and on since almost uh, the beginning of this program. He runs a, uh, a website called stadiumjourney.com. He also runs a magazine called Stadium Journey. Um, at least I think he still has the magazine. We'll talk about that in a second. He's got a podcast uh, he, he had to relaunch the website, I think, in November. He'll, he'll talk about that. But the thing that's exciting as well about Paul, what Paul does, is in terms of ranking um, all these venues throughout the world, literally, globally, uh, uh, to watch sports, uh, he just, they came out with, um, they've got the top, top 100 stadium experiences of 2017, and we're going to be talking about that as well. But, but before we get to all the meat and potatoes, let's, let's introduce Paul and welcome him to the program. Paul Sweeney, how are you doing tonight? 
I'm great, guys. Thanks for having me on again. No, it's uh, our pleasure. And again, uh, you've rescheduled a couple times, so we appreciate that. Uh, Paul, tell me about, uh, tell us, get everybody caught up. It's been so long since we've had you on the program, and a lot of folks uh, may not have, you know, tuned in when you were on and, and, and may not, frankly, be um, in tune with Stadium Journey. So why don't you just kind of give uh, everybody kind of an, a brief overview of what Stadium Journey is, uh, just uh, in terms of uh, the actual enterprise. So our, our goal basically is to provide people with sort of a uh, travel guide for when you go to a game, especially if it's a venue you don't know very well. And we do that by writing reviews of um, ballparks and stadiums. And we try to highlight, you know, everything you need to know, what to eat, where to park, where to sit, um, maybe hotels, restaurants in the area, things, things to that nature. Um, and we've got about 100 writers located all around the country and, and Canada and all over the world for that matter. And we go out and we go to games and then we put together our reviews and hopefully people find those useful for when they go to a game. Well, that's pretty much uh, what it boils down to. And um, you had a situation where you had to launch a new website. Why don't you kind of talk about that? Yeah, 2017 was sort of a hard year for us. Uh, we had uh, joined the Scout Network for a period of time and um, – we, we had to move over our content on, onto their network. And then Scott was bought out um, in early 2017 by CBS Sports. Uh, CBS Sports decided that they, they really only wanted the Scout properties that, that focused on one specific team, like a, a Detroit Tigers website, things like that. And, and we were just a little too broad. Uh, so we left that network and came back to our old website. Um, our old website, we hadn't really been updating uh, the way we should. And about a month into that, uh, we had a backup system that failed. We lost all of our content and had to rebuild our site. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a silver lining situation though. Um, we were able to launch a new site that I think is a lot easier to use. It's definitely more, uh, it's easier to use on the back end, So it's easier for, for me and, and the editors, but hopefully it's good for, um, our readers as well. The website um, navigation, Paul, when, when somebody goes to stadiumjourney.com, and by the way, that's that's the URL, stadiumjourney.com, um, for a first-time visitor, how would you recommend that they navigate? Well, it's pretty easy. You just click on the top where it says stadium reviews, and then we've got a list of different leagues where we've uh, covered every stadium in the league. And so really, I would just say go to your favorite league and, and click there. It'll take you to a landing page and you can click on a stadium that you like or that you're thinking about visiting. Um, and you can either learn about that stadium or if you're someone who knows the stadium well, I always encourage people to click on the, the button that says uh, to provide your own review and, and you can share your experiences at that stadium. How is that engagement? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the 100 or so writers that provide the actual official reviews for the website, but how is the engagement with the readers? It's good. Um, a lot of times we'll get either, um, you know, corrections mm -hmm. or um, additional information that maybe we missed. You know, I think one of the weaknesses in the way that we do what we do is that our guys go to one or two games at a venue and then put together our guide. Um, and that can be both helpful, uh, but it also has its holes. You know, it's helpful to have kind of a fresh set of eyes and not have sort of a Homer vision of a stadium. But at the same time, we can't cover everything and there's probably things that we miss. So I'm always really appreciative when someone who maybe is a season ticket holder comes on and says, you know, you, you miss this, you know, specialty sausage in section 320. Um, and that's, that's the thing I go to every single time. So I, I at least hope in, in a best case scenario that we're getting the best of both worlds, that we're getting the, the knowledge of the fans that go to a lot of games, but we're also getting sort of, um, um, a, a professional, uh, perspective of a venue. You know, our guys, I've got some guys that go to, 100, 150 venues in a year. And so they really have a different eye than someone who goes to, let's say, 81 games at Comerica Park. 
Sure, that makes sense. We're talking with Paul Sweeney of StadiumJourney.com here on the Needrix. I'm Greg Eno from uh, WordPress blog, Out of Bounds, and Big Al Albeaton will bring him in in a second. Um, what is the criteria, Paul? I mean, th- you know, this is one of those topics where you know you could really go deep down a rabbit hole in a lot of different ways because when you go to a stadium, there's so many um, things that you could review, and there's so many things that can go on uh, during the experience. So how do you decide what the criteria is when you put these reviews together? Are your writers all kind of under the same, use the same kind of format? Are they all instructed to to pay attention to certain things? I mean, how do you go about constructing, because it's not like re- reviewing a movie, for example, where somebody gives it their opinion on what they saw on the screen. There's so much going on from parking to food to, you know, ambiance to, I mean, there's so many different things. So how do you guys go about consolidating all that into uh, into a review? Well, first of all, all of our writers do have the same uh, guidelines of, of things that they should be looking for, the same sort of rating scale that, that is used. And and they're given sort of a, collection, a data collection packet, if you will. And when they go to the stadium, they're looking for certain things to, to sort of fill in for the review. Um, we look at the food and beverage that's served in the stadium. We look at the overall atmosphere, the neighborhood where the stadium is located, uh, the fans and how they conduct themselves, uh, access, which includes things like you mentioned, parking, traffic, uh, restrooms. Uh, we look at the overall return on investment. Is it worth the price you'll pay? And then we also have a category for extras. Now that, that being said, I also, you know, like a movie review, this is still a subjective medium and there's going to be someone who goes to a game at a stadium and loves it and says that's perfect. And another person might go to that same stadium and say, it's, you know, it's okay. It's mediocre. Um, so I, I try real hard to tell people that we're not scientists. We're not trying to be a hundred percent, um, sort of objective, we understand that sports tugs at your heartstrings and that certain things are, are going to score better than others. And that's okay to me. I, to me, that's part of the fun. That's part of the debate. And someone can come back and say, boy, you guys are way off on, on this one and, and here's why. And I think that's where we, where we really have some fun conversations. Talk about, before we bring Big Al in, I got one more question for you, Paul. I, I, and it, it dawned on me, I hadn't really asked you this before, I don't think. And how did this whole thing start? I mean, obviously, when these, you know, something like this has to start somewhere. Where, where did the idea come from? Was it just you? Was it a group of people? Was there a, a moment that, that, that where a bell rang off in your head and said, we, I ought to do this? What was the genesis of Stadium Journey? Yeah, um, so I have a very specific memory. I went to a conference for, for work. Um, I used to work in the nonprofit sector in the Chicago area, and I was down in a conference in Houston, um, just a couple blocks away from Minute Maid Park where the Astros play. And I arrived on a Sunday, and I was walking around, and just so happened there was a game going on, so I went to the game. And I found myself during that conference I was attending sort of scribbling notes to myself about, you know, what's important in a sports experience? What what do I enjoy? What do I think other people enjoy? And so at least the start of the rating scale that we use today was born in Houston in 2009 at that conference. Um, but then originally, I, I thought this was just going to be sort of a hobby that I had that I did on my own. I would try to go to, I, I thought I would try to go to the, the major four sports, NBA, NHL, uh, baseball, and, and NFL. But I quickly found as we launched that, one, it was going to take me forever to do this, and it it was going to cost me a lot of money. And two, there were so many people who were interested in this concept, but also interested in other things, that we began to add writers as they would contact me and say, hey, I think this is a cool thing you're doing, but what about college baseball? Mm -hmm. What about the Ontario Hockey League? What about NASCAR? And so as we added people who had interests that were a little bit different than mine, I think that's when we really began to cook with gas and got something interesting. 
Yeah, the uh, you're right. I mean, this you, you click on on uh, when you go to the website, like you said, when you navigate, you click on reviews, and you click on the different sports, and uh, you know you even got the you know the category, of course, other sports. It's really fascinating how much there really is on this website. Let's bring Big Allen. First of all, I'm Greg, and we're, we're you're listening to the New Jerks or watching the New Jerks, depending on how you're. Uh, contacting or connecting with us today. We're talking with Paul Sweeney on uh, about, from Stadium Journey. And Big Al Beaton is here. Uh, what you got for uh, Paul? Well, we'd have to talk about uh, the big, the latest, this like big project involved Stadium Journey with, was your top 100 stadium experience list of uh, 2017. 100 different, uh, and oh, obviously 100 different venues. And it's amazingly, uh, amazing that the type of variety that is involved here, everything from your you know, from your big four sports, but you have uh, also involved here, such as the OHL, there's some auto racing mixed in, uh, uh, NCAA hockey, that sort of thing. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, how you put that list together, and do you agree with how it turned out, or do you have some favorites you think that ended up too low, or some that uh, you thought were ranked too high? Yeah, there's there's always some that don't that don't jive with my own personal <laughs> opinion, but that's that's part of the fun you know this year we approached it a little bit differently because our database is not complete we haven't restored all of our content from when the site crashed in may uh this year we actually pulled our writers and asked them to give us their top 10 favorite stadium experiences and so this is united states and canada only Mm -hmm. but what that did is it really opened it up to a few uh, you know kind of surprising places that hadn't made our list in previous years, but yet we still had some of, you know, it's interesting to see that we still had some stadiums that continued to be high up on our list um, that we had had in previous years. So in other years that we've done this, we've, we've taken our rating on the website and the ratings from our readers and just made a list. It was a, we would just pull it the straight data. Here's, here's how they rank, one, two, three, four. Um, so this time having everyone give us our top 10 was, uh, I think interesting. Uh, certainly every year that we do this list, we get people that are like overjoyed that their favorite stadium is wherever on the list. And there's people who you know, literally write an email to me and tell me what an idiot I am and curse at me too. So, uh, you know, that's, that's part of the fun. We, we get that too. We get that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I was clicking as as you were talking. You know, I I clicked on uh, Comerica Park. I just wanted to kind of just take a, a local flavor, so I just randomly picked uh, the Tigers. And you've got uh, when I say you, the site has uh, a total score. This is based on a one to five system, of course, uh, with five being the best. You've got uh, Comerica Park four point four three, and I'm looking through here, and you gave uh, or again the, the site gave uh, Comerica Park a five for atmosphere. Uh, and fours all the way across for I think a five for fans, which was nice to see. Uh, four for access, four on return on investment, five for extras. Very uh, positive reviews for Comerica Park. Um, you've been there, I'm assuming personally. Uh, is that not correct, Paul? Uh, yeah. And your your yeah, thoughts? I'm, I'm, I'm based in Ann Arbor, so the Detroit yeah. teams are definitely in my backyard. Yeah. And your thoughts on uh, Comerica Park versus uh, Tiger Stadium, for example? Well, you know, Tiger Stadium was a classic, but I, I think that most of my feelings for Tiger Stadium have more to do with sentimentality and less to do with that being a really nice ballpark. You know, it certainly had its flaws. It had its character, too. Um, but I think Comerica Park overall is a better fan experience from the, the size of the seats um, to the food that's served there um, to some of the activities for kids and families. Um uh, if I had to choose between the two, I would take Comerica Park for sure. We're talking about Paul Sweeney of StadiumJourney.com. You're listening to or watching The Knee Jerks. I'm Greg Eno from uh, WordPress Blog Out of Bounds and The Wing Wheeler and Big Al. Al Beaton is here as well. Uh, I'm looking at the Detroit Red Wings uh, entry here on the site, and I'm not seeing a review yet for Little Caesars Arena. Is that me or is that true? That's true. We haven't done our formal review yet. We have done Little Caesars uh, Arena with the Pistons, but we have not yet done our formal review for the Red Wings. Okay. Um, Everything I'm hearing is, and I'm curious if you guys have been there, but all of my writers that have been to Little Caesars Arena have really loved what they've seen there. I I know I've had probably 
10 or so writers that have visited recently. And I'm also a very uh, soft spot in my heart for Oakland University because my daughter attends there and uh, the yeah. old arena where the uh, Golden Grizzlies play basketball. If I remember correctly, when we talked before and what I've seen from you, uh, the old arena got some good reviews as well. Yeah, I like the old arena a lot. I really like um, sort of, you know, I, I like any arena like that where the walkway is sort of above the seats and all the seats are right down on the floor. It's, to me, the arena is sort of a miniature version of uh, uh, the Iowa Hawkeyes basketball arena that is – I'm blanking on right now but um yeah i think the arena is one of my favorites in the state for sure um paul tell us a little bit about the, the writers uh that, that work for the for the website and and how did you find them? Did they all come to you were there referrals uh, did you put out ads i mean uh, you've 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 accumulated quite a stable of folks here how did you do it yeah all of those things uh early on it was me reaching out you know, I would I would search the internet and just say, you know, stadium travel, and I would find bloggers who have a real passion for traveling around to see different stadiums, and I would try to recruit some some people like that. Um, but certainly, there's plenty of people that would approach me and and uh, say, boy, you sure are missing something by not covering this sport or this stadium. Um, and so we've added people that have just contacted me out of the blue that have worked out fantastic um you know the other place that we'll go sometimes is uh, like college newspapers and i've found um, either college students or now recent grads who are have an interest in this and see it as a way to you know do some extra writing to kind of build a resume um so really our, our group ranges from college students all the way to retirees and pretty much everything in between that's great. We're talking with Paul Sweeney here, listening to the Knee Jerks or watching the Knee Jerks. I'm Greg Eno from uh, WordPress Blog Out of Bounds and the Wing Wheeler. And let's bring Big Al back in. What you got for Paul Sweeney? Well, uh, speaking of you know your contributors, it looks like you've also started to dip your uh, your toes into the podcast area as you've started a new podcast. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you discuss, uh, who uh, join you on your podcast, and you know just what your your thoughts are and your podcasting experience so far. Well, the podcast has been a lot of fun, and it's generally not me. It's generally a few of our other writers. I've, I've participated. We've only done six so far. We just launched it in November. Um, we've got one of our writers in Kitchener, Ontario, one of our writers in Indianapolis, and a writer uh, just outside Boston. And the three of them are doing the show, and we're bringing on guests. I, that's one thing about our group of writers. We've got a hundred really interesting people. So we, we have no shortage in guests, um, which is a nice problem to have. Uh, you know, I think the biggest problem we've had is trying to figure out who should we bring on for this episode. Um, but I, I hope people are liking them. We, we try to talk about um, sort of current events in, in stadiums, you know, things being built or torn down um uh, possible moves that that teams might be making uh, but also just kind of embrace that that ethos of stadium travel and and the chance to uh see new places i think that's the common theme both of our writers and the people who are interested in what we're writing about uh it's a group of people who want to experience the world and, and see new things through sports you know speaking of uh Things being built, let's talk about things being torn down locally. Of course, the Pontiac Silverdome was recently imploded. And um, that, uh, Paul, was built at a time in the mid-'70s when the Superdome, of course, was built. And about 10 years after the Astrodome went up, when, you know, dome stadiums and artificial turf was all the rage in the NFL, not just the NFL, but really in all in, in, in baseball as well. And what were your thoughts about, about that time, those kinds of stadiums. I mean, the, the Silverdome, you know, I, I thought, you know, frankly, if you were going to review it, I don't know, it, it would get really very high reviews. It wasn't, to me, a great stadium. It was big, of course, it was cavernous. Um, it was a, a nightmare for basketball when the Pistons played there. But with those kinds of stadiums, and those they don't build those anymore, of course, really. Um, just talk about that that time frame in the mid-70s. It's kind of we take like a, we hit the turn back machine or the way back machine. Talk a little bit about uh, stadiums of that ilk. Well, the thing about the stadiums of, of the seventies is 
they just felt so cookie cutter and, and one sort of mirrored the other. I, I think the nice thing about having that period of stadiums is that it really uh, makes you appreciate what they're building today. I think, you know, and, and especially uh, major league ballparks uh, show this, but, but I think even um, Little Caesars Arena and the new uh, Falcons Stadium in Atlanta, um, sort of this catering to the fans and realizing that they are competing with technology um, at home and they're competing with the comfort of one's couch. And so I think, you know, we're really in for some good things as far as fan experience over the next decade as more stadiums get built and, and renovated because they, they know, the teams know that they, you know, it's, it's getting harder and harder to bring people into the stadium. So they have to really provide a, a great fan experience. And so for those of us who like to travel, we're going to be the beneficiaries of that. One more question before we let you go. What kind of cooperation uh, do you get from the leagues themselves, the teams themselves, uh, when you guys have to, you know, you send your writers to these, to these venues, obviously they need tickets or they need some sort of access. Uh, do you get cooperation from the respective leagues and the teams, and or is that kind of on a case by case basis? It's definitely case by case. Uh, you know, and you guys have done enough media that you learn that every media relations department is different, and some are mm-hmm. very accommodating. Most, I would say, most are very accommodating. Some try to make every aspect of your life difficult, in my opinion. But I would say most teams welcome us coming in, and sometimes a team will say you know what, could you not come to this Thursday game Uh, because we know it's not going to have that great of attendance. Maybe could you come to the Saturday game where where we play whatever rival. Um, So I appreciate that, that teams want, you know, us to show them in their best light possible. And they understand that this is sort of a marketing experience or uh, opportunity for them. Um, So I would say most teams want to put their best foot forward and help us sort of along the path of showing the best aspects of their stadium experience. And that's, that's when I think we do our best work is when there's a, someone from the team who, who comes in and says, Hey, make sure that you go over here and see this or take a picture of that. Um, it can, it can really be helpful and um, sort of providing a full picture for people. Stadiumjourney.com is the website. Uh, check it out. It's um, it's easy to navigate through. I, it, it, Paul's right. You just go there, hit Stadium Reviews. There's a drop-down menu. There's a number of uh, leagues, number of sports you can click on, and then from there you can zero in on particular teams and their and their venues if you're interested in that, or if you just want to start to nose around and just kind of look at. Uh, you can also, of course, look at the the, the top 100 sites for 2017 you can do that there's lots of things you can do on the website paul sweeney of course you can also follow them on facebook uh, stadium journey has got a facebook page as well and uh paul thanks for being here and doing this for us and and uh continued good luck with this enterprise thanks guys it's always good to talk to you and i appreciate you having me on ah our pleasure thanks paul take care thanks. paul sweeney of stadiumjourney.com and uh, we, we thank him for doing that uh quite a um it, it, when you think about it, Al, it, it, what he's been, and this is only since 2009. I, yeah. I, for some reason, I thought it was it was went back further than that. But in nine years, the amount of venues that, that they have reviewed and provided information for, and it, it's very well written. It's very, um, it gets right to the point. It's not it's not too voluminous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really. Uh, quite fascinating that, that, that they've been able to do so much in nine years yeah considering uh when we first had him on a show about seven eight years ago and uh and what he's gone from where he was then to where it is now it's it's it's, it's really impressive and it was a hell of a lot of work you know as he said you know he's he's uh, had some issues about you know different blog networks he's belonged to and the site <laughs> itself but it seems to have stabilized into a very interesting and successful enterprise Yep, absolutely. Uh, let's go to clue two of the birthday game. Uh, this is for the color forms depiction of the baseball winter meetings. Um, the this person, I guess, I was born in 1943. Made his, made his name in the world of hockey. Played for the Red Wings. I will also tell you, and I already told you, that he was part of a big blockbuster trade uh, in the late 60s. And I will my next clue, which you know, although I think you already know who this is, but yeah. this person also scored a very iconic. 
very iconic goal uh, that will forever make him a hero in Canada. Uh, yeah, I believe we are talking about Gary Unger. No. No? I thought it was Gary Unger. Oh, I thought for sure you knew it. Ah. I thought I thought that the, the iconic goal uh, in 1972 was going to be the, the clue that was going to push you over the top, ah. but uh, you blew it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly. <laughs> So I guess we'll have to give the 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 the, uh, the uh, slam dunk for clue three. I, I'm surprised. So. But you're right. Unger <laughs> was in that trade though. You got two yeah. of the guys that are in that trade. Yeah, so exactly. That was uh, if I remember right, that was uh, the, the Wings regretted trading him for years because he was a very productive player of St. Louis. I remember right for a very long time. Well, no, the, the Unger. You're talking. You're thinking of when they traded Unger to St. Louis for Red Berenson. This is a trade where the Red Wings got got Unger. Ah, and got, so and we're got Frank Mahovlich. Back, what I was thinking. Yeah, this was when they got Unger and they got Frank Mahovlich and they got. Um, See, I'm, I guess it got me confused. I'm thinking when they traded them both. No, uh, no, this is. A few years later. They, well, they did trade yeah. them both. You're right. A few yeah, years later. See, that's what but got this, me. I'm thinking that trade, not the original yeah. trade. Ah, yeah, this, yeah, see, this trade, was a trick this, question. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was when they got Unger and they got Frank Mahovlich and they got. Uh, um, I think Floyd Smith for Ullman, um, this person, and I, I can't remember who the, who the sixth person was. It was a six-player trade. Right. So anyway, that's we'll we'll, we'll get the we'll get the yeah, slam see, dunk. Now, we're, now everybody's confused, and we should just move on. So. <laughs> Let's go. Let's, let's All right, we so we've missed quite a bit uh, since we last talked. It's been about six weeks. Thanks to uh, Greg almost dying from the flu. So yeah. uh, uh, essentially, last time we talked, the uh, Lions still had a uh, head coach. Uh, and they still had a defensive coordinator. Uh, the Pistons were actually looking in pretty decent shape. They were starting to falter a little bit, but were still you know, in decent playoffs positioning. Uh, the Red Wings were being the Red Wings. I don't think much has changed there. And uh, Michigan State was a respected institution, more or less. <laughs> In six weeks, uh, like I said, the Lions uh, are, are expecting to be able to name their head coach uh, probably next Monday or Tuesday. Uh, the Pistons are in a free fall. Actually, they lost again tonight. The, they lost while we were talking to Paul. They lost their eighth straight. The Red Wings have announced they're going to be sellers, to no one's surprise. And Michigan State has now become... Uh, probably the most hated university in the country <laughs> and for good reason. And uh, there's a, a lot to, to break down of all this. So uh, rather than end the podcast on a depressing note, Greg, why don't we start on a depressing note? We got, we should talk about the Michigan state stuff first, because really that has r dominated discussion in the sports world and here in Detroit, especially over the past week or so since the, uh, well, about a week and a half since the Larry Nassar sentencing began where, the judge, to her credit, allowed everyone who had ever been violated by Larry Nasser, who was, as I'm sure everybody knows by now, was a, uh, a member of the uh, facility, a member of the uh, medical staff at MSU, along with being the Olympic gymnastics doctor, who uh, ultimately sexually abused over 150 uh, kids, teenagers, uh, young women, uh, in, in the guise of treating them for uh, gymnastics injuries and, and sports injuries and the like. To her credit, she allowed over 150 women to speak their mind and, you know, essentially give their impact statement to an answer. It ended up taking, I believe, like five days, if I remember right. It was an amazing, amazing sight. Well, that so when that finally came to an end, and Nasser, and actually this is not done with Nasser because that was just on his child pornography charges. He still has more on the on some of the molestation charges he has has to deal with. So regardless, he's going to prison for, as the uh, as the presiding judge said. You're, this is a life sentence for him. But between that, when that went down, Greg, the university uh, the university administration, specifically uh, President uh, how come, uh, uh, Luann Simon, uh, some of the members of the board of trustees, especially Joe Ferguson. Uh, Tom Izzo, for that matter, all came off with some very, very tone deaf and uh, in some ways uh, 
came off with said statements and things about what was going on that really came off as more about themselves or more about protecting the university than uh, I, I you know giving uh, it just came off as foot and mouth disease from everything they had been saying while this was all going on so to to least to michigan state's credit finally simon resigned this week and then shit really hit the fan uh, uh, simon resigned on wednesday as she should have she needed to fall on the sword uh even though she had this plausible pardon me plausible deniability uh which a lot of things that she said especially in her resignation letter came off as uh something was going on but i wanted to keep them to keep me away from this so i had plausible deniability it was it really ugly but on friday uh Athletic director Mark uh, Tallis, who is, was a very respected athletic director in the nation, he was part of the, for example, the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee, he uh, announced his retirement at approximately 9 a.m. on Friday. And part of his statement was, I'm not running from anything. Well, about two hours later, ESPN dropped an absolute bombshell via other outside the lines uh, uh, journalism department, you know, you know, led by Bob Lee and a lot of great investigative reporters, essentially saying there was a lot more to this than just what was going on with Larry Nasser, specifically cover-ups and uh, kid glove handling of sexual assault issues with the basketball and football team, specifically involving Tom Izzo and uh, Mark, Dan, uh, Mark D'Antoni. So, Mark Antonio, pardon me. I want to, for some reason, I want to call him D'Antonio, but you know. Anyway, so Greg, where we stand right now is D'Antonio made a uh, very gritted teeth, jaw jutting, chest out, defiant uh, thing, saying, "No, we did everything the way we we're supposed to. We did every, you know." It came it came off as again kind of self serving to him, not saying much about what's going on with the people who, who were very, very greatly hurt by what down. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Izzo has had two games to deal with during this time. And after his very tone deaf statement about a week and a half, two weeks ago, you can tell he, is, he looks completely beaten down by this. You know, he's essentially saying, uh, we're, we want to be part of the solution with helping the survivors. I, I'm not going to say anything more. And I guess, uh, after today's game with Maryland, which they did win, uh, ESPN reporter came at him again, especially asking him about, uh, I believe it's Travis Walton, who was uh, had a rape accusation against him in 2010 while he was coaching with Izzo, and Izzo allowed him to coach, let alone there's the uh, other incident with Walton while he was coaching uh, MSU where he punched a woman in a bar and ended up getting pleaded down to littering. So, and Izzo essentially said he didn't remember why he left, which I find... Kind of hard to believe since he was one of Izzo's favorite players. So, Greg, this is where we stand. Uh, State of Michigan uh, Attorney General Bill Schuette has appointed an independent special prosecutor to investigate all these allegations against MSU. It's going to be assisted by the Michigan State Police. Uh, there's an ongoing, there's right now an interim president. I don't have his name handy at the moment, but they're undergoing a search to uh, name that. Uh, and other than that, Oh, and the NCAA as well has finally said they're going to investigate all this. And there was reports over the past couple of days that uh, the NCAA was very, very slow to react and maybe even ignored reports of the sexual abuse that was going on at Michigan State. So <laughs> if there's, I, I think that about covers everything in a nutshell. But it really comes down to is that it really appears that even if D'Antonio and Izzo and the gymnastics coach, Kathy Clays, I believe her name is, uh, if they, they were, like Clays was allowed to retire, you know, rather than be disciplined or be, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, have anything happen to her, essentially. She's just allowed to retire. Uh, but right now it looks like the school did everything to keep their revenue sports running smoothly, and if that meant treating some of these uh, situations, I hate calling it situations, you didn't say what they were, possible rapes, possible uh, sexual abuse accusations. They, they 
kind of either swept them under the carpet. Looks like there was a buddy-buddy relationship with the Ingham County prosecutor who happens now to be working, this, this prosecutor is now working for MSU. It really appears that MSU was more worried about protecting the revenue sports, protecting their star doctor, Nasher, because he was nationally, held worldwide known as for his gymnastics uh, treatments, and protecting the administration at the expense of who could be hundreds of women at this point, that for all we know. Mm-hmm. So I guess there's a new villain in town, Greg, and it's the Michigan State University. And they, for and to be honest with you, it really feels like they brought this all upon themselves. They could have, if they had handled things appropriately with Nasser, even several years ago when this all started to go down, they wouldn't be to the point now where people are screaming, you know, you're Penn State all over again, you're Baylor all over again, we want the death penalty, so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's more just a mess. It's ugly. And especially if you have a daughter college age who was in school, this has really got to be disturbing to you. Well, first of all, this is sadly, in my estimation, uh, just a microcosm of what, of the way sexual assault is treated in this country, period. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know that it, it makes a lot of news when it's a big university like Michigan State. I know it makes a lot of news when presidents retire and ADs mm-hmm. retire and ESPN comes out with these damning reports and so forth. But, uh, you know, it, it just it's, a, it's amazing to me, Al, how many of these institutions just don't learn from prior other from, from other institutions mistakes. Yeah, you, you know, would have just, thought after Penn State. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, and what I mean by that is that um, it's just, it's just, it's really it's just PR one oh PR one oh one. If you yes. get, if you can get ahead of the game, with um, with transparency, Bang, with, that's the word right there. With yes. getting rid of people who need to be gotten rid of um, before the the you know what hits the fan, you can actually come out looking pretty good in these kind of situations. You can almost look heroic uh, if you do the right thing right away. And you don't hesitate, and you can come out and say, "Look, we found out this nasty stuff about Dr. Nasser, but guess what? We we terminated him. Yeah. And here's why we terminated him. And this is because this is not acceptable. This is not who we're about, what we're about, and this is just not going to be tolerated. And then mm-hmm. you then become held up uh, as a as a poster child the right way. As yeah. here's the right way to handle this. Here, you know, you could even say, you know, we're after Penn State, we're, we're we're going to make sure that never happens at East Lansing, mm-hmm. and you can come out looking pretty good, despite the you know the, the atrocities that 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 occurred. At least you you would will have would have nipped a lot of that in the bud, and and it's just to me I just don't understand where what the thinking is that that if we just keep trying to cover it up and we keep yeah. giving, you know, um, you mentioned uh, handling with with kid gloves and. You know, yeah, it was like the, you know, it really looks like uh, the Michigan uh, Michigan State Police and the Ingham County Police and prosecutors really handled things differently when it came to the revenue sports. I mean, I'll, you know, there's like how does uh, slugging uh, slugging a woman in a bar get pleaded down to littering, for example? You well, know? you know, again, Al, it's it's this is the way that sexual assault is still being treated in this country. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's it's not just athletics. It's not just uh, at universities. It's it's all over the country. Business, in terms of, yeah, everywhere business entertainment. It's really coming to the fore now. You're yeah, right. we've seen it. We're, right, we're, we've seen it in 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 entertainment. We've seen it in politics. We've seen yes. it in in, in, in in business world, mm-hmm. where uh, those who do come forward are. I always have to laugh when when people accuse these women who come forward of being some sort of money grubbing. Uh, yeah. Out for some sort of notoriety. I, I don't know why anybody would want to put themselves exactly <laughs> through all that, you know. But it's just that those who do come forward put themselves, you know, expose themselves to all sorts of hate, all sorts of uh, naysayers. There's still the blame the victim mentality that goes on. It uh, doesn't matter, you know. I, I remember reading a, a, an article uh, a couple of weeks ago about a, a, a gentleman uh, on, a, on a flight. Who mm-hmm. um, during the flight reached yeah. to female passenger to his right mm-hmm. and started fondling her while she was asleep, 
And she woke up and, you know, uh, he admitted to it. Yep. He's, you know, the whole nine yards. And still the comments section in the article were suggesting that the woman was somehow to blame. Yeah. Oh, well, how could she not wake up? How could she could how could she have slept through all this? And it's still the mentality of let's blame the victim first. Let's see what the victim did wrong first before we look at the at the perpetrator, even if the perpetrator admits to doing this horrible thing. So um, but so there's two to me, there's two components of the story. Yeah. There's the mm -hmm. the way sexual assault is, is still being treated, unfortunately, in this country and the way, like you said, revenue sports are insulated by institutions around the, the country. Yeah. You can only wonder now, what's we already had Penn State, we had Baylor, we had Michigan State now. What's the next one? Right. When when is the next one gonna when are we when are we gonna find out about the next university that's gonna be uh, that it's gonna be revealed that they uh, were trying to cover things up and 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 sweep stuff under the rug and, and not be transparent and not uh, get in front of the head of the curve and not do the right thing. Um, you know I don't know, but you're right. For right now, Michigan State uh, is. It, it, I feel badly for people who, who, who the alumni, yeah. the people who are going there now, uh, all those who are associated with the university who are not, who didn't do anything wrong, who, frankly, have got to be a lot less proud of of their of yeah. their alma mater than they were two weeks ago. Yeah, and one of the things that comes to mind is at this point, you know, you, you hear uh, Izzo and D'Antonio saying, you know, we did everything cor correctly. We did this with the authorities. But at this point, after seeing what the administration has done for over a decade, and let alone the fact that ESPN had to sue Michigan State three different times to finally get all the, uh, all the information they could via the Freedom of Information Act, which should not be a big deal. In, in, but... Why would you believe anything right now coming out of MSU? I mean, at, I don't know why. I, I, they, they lost all benefit of the doubt by the way they handled the Nassar stuff. So now, why should I believe Tom Izzo and Mark D'Antonio and whoever's going to be the new AD, who's going to be the new president, or God forbid the Board of Trustees, if, that, you know, if uh, someone like Joe Ferguson saying, oh, the Nassar thing, there's other things we have to deal with here. Could you? I couldn't believe he said something like that on an interview. So why would anybody believe anything from MSU at this point? Obviously, you know things are going to change because when there's a a special prosecutor, he cannot just ask what you know investigate. He can also subpoena. You know he can start. Uh, essentially, once you get the feds involved, once you get actual people who can has the power of subpoena involved. All hell's going to break loose. We saw that with Michigan in the Ed Martin case. You know, if you know if that car doesn't flip over that one night with all those, uh, uh, you know, with all those kids, you know, back in the early '90s, and th that doesn't, and that leads to Ed Martin. Still, nothing would have happened until the feds got involved with Ed Martin, uh, with his being a, uh, involved with the numbers, and they got involved with uh, his money, which led to the power of subpoena, which led to people going to jail, which led to Michigan being Michigan basketball being essentially wiped off the face of the map for a decade. That could happen with Michigan State in both sports right now, considering now that the power subpoena is upon them. Uh, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of nervous people at Michigan State right now because in the case of Penn State, people ended up going to prison. You have to wonder if the same thing is ultimately going to happen here at Michigan State. The problem is it's not going to be a fast process. This could take years. Yeah, this we're not exactly. We are only at the beginning of this. It's it seems like we're, you know, we it seems like it, this has been going on forever, and we're yes. in, in the in the middle of this. Where it's just only beginning. Uh, you mentioned the special prosecutor. You mentioned subpoenas, and the other thing too, Al, is that is is that now it puts iconic. At least for the well, iconic to a national degree with Izzo for sure. Maybe not so much with yeah, Antonio. He's a Hall of Famer. He's already yeah, in the Hall of Famer. Right. I mean, now you you've got you're gonna. I can already see it coming. Is that people are gonna be very conflicted. Yeah. People who have held Tom Izzo in high regard for ever are now maybe might be forced to look at him in a different light. Yeah. You mentioned the you mentioned the tone deaf comments uh, that he had initially when he said something weird like. I hope they arrested the right guy, which I don't yes, know what the hell that yes, was all about. Yeah. 
Uh, that was really bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you mentioned a couple th- a while ago. You said, well, you know, that D'Antoni was defiant, and yes. you know, all, we handled it the way it was supposed to be. But you know, sometimes when it comes to stuff like this, you have to go above and beyond just what the guidelines say. I mean, it's one yeah, thing that they were doing the bare minimum. Yeah, yeah. the bare minimum yeah. doesn't doesn't exactly. fly with this kind of stuff. Yes. It really doesn't. That's what I was talking about earlier about getting in front of things. I would almost rather see um, institutions overreact a little bit and go the opposite, go that direction yeah. than underreact or, like you said, do the bare minimum and just enough to get by to satisfy some sort of guidelines. But, but you know, the other thing you didn't mention is that there was that um, sexual assault counselor who, who yes. resigned. Yes. She'd been, uh, I think she'd been there for like six or seven years. And she, yeah, was, she was like finally, ESPN's, uh, I guess, whistleblower. Yeah, she was fed up. She was, you know, look, this is just, this is not right. It's not transparent. The right people aren't making the right, are, aren't making these kind of decisions that the, the mm-hmm. people that would normally make those kind of decisions at a more re- reputable institution, that's not happening here. Um, you know, so this is just, unfortunately, for, for Michigan State, mm-hmm. it's just the scratching of the surface. And you mentioned, you know, no benefit of the doubt. How can we ever believe anything that they say? That's why it was imperative that President Simon resign or retire, and that's yeah. why it was imperative probably the Mark Hollis retire, right. because I mean the only way you're going to get anybody to believe you is if you bring in new new right. leadership. Uh, but again, that new leadership though, uh, you know, be, that can't be tainted by any sort of ties to the old leadership either, yeah. really. Because See, then and that's, that's the problem that's with the board of trustees, for example. I mean George Perlis. Yeah, it has been there. You know, the former head coach, former athletic director is on the board of trustees. Joel Ferguson has been a part, part of the board of trustees uh, for for decades. There's a Breslin, you know, who is you know, the son of the man who who the Breslin Center is named after is on the board of trustees. I think a lot is playing into this, Greg, is that Michigan State is a very insular institution, far more so than uh, than the University of Michigan or other Big Ten schools. It really feels like. Uh, with you know, with this uh, the administration and the board of trustees uh, being completely dominated by MSU grads, is that I think that played a big part in this circle of the wagons. We have to protect the name rather than worry about the victims. Right, and uh, and what happens? And ultimately, what always happens when you do that is you end up yep. being in, in a worse scenario than if you had taken the other tack. Exactly. So let me ask you this, kind of wrap this discussion up, because I have a feeling this is something that's going to be a, a topic for, uh, for quite some time to come here in southeast Michigan. Like I said, this is going to take years more than likely. And, of course, and lots and lots of money, because uh, I think Michigan State needs to be prepared to dole out hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, in settlement money. Oh. Uh, is uh, other than uh, I'm I'm not sure what how about I'm one I'm not made up about my mind's not made up about shooting because it's an election year he's going to be the GOP nominee for governor there's some underlying stuff going on there of him but I'll give him the better of the doubt because he is the, the attorney general but let me ask you this do you think Izzo and D'Antonio ultimately survive this because these guys would have options specifically Izzo I mean he's been tempted to go to the NBA a couple different times, I believe, with the Cavaliers and the Hawks. You know, you got to wonder, you know, maybe they'll get out when the getting's good. I don't know. But as things play out, you you have to start wondering, you know, both these guys have been there for a very long time. Izzo's been there for decades. D'Antonio's been there for more than a decade. You got to wonder if they'll be able to survive this because, as you said, if you really want to have a true reckoning, if you really want to bring closure to this, if you want to start – just the healing process. I think you got to blow out the entire athletic department. This is this is almost going to be kind of a litmus test, Al, uh, yeah. to see how, um, again, how other universities may handle this. Michigan State yeah. has an opportunity now to um, to really put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and 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 um, how that plays out with guys like D'Antonio and Izzo, mm-hmm. I think will be a referendum on how. Um, this is played out in other in other walks of life. I, I, you yeah. know, I think that um, we've seen a lot of powerful men go down already with the sexual assault stuff around the country. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, people in entertainment, po- uh, big name politicians. It's it's yeah. amazing. And this has only been going on probably since uh, two or three months. 
Who knows but what the hell's going to happen? You know, this is not, you know, the, these aren't coaches that have only been there for a few years who are kind of expendable. Yeah. You know, these are men who are the face. Let's and face that's it. A Tom, good call. If these Tom guys Izzo were established, is, they'd be out the door. You're Tom right. Izzo is the face of Michigan State, let's face it. Yes. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, yeah, and if he had more, come out more so than the president, more so than the athletic yeah. director. And if he had come out with a strong, strong statement, you know, against what has been going on, rather than that wishy-washy, did the right guy get convicted type oh. thing, this this could have happened. You no, know, because as you said, as Tom, Tom Izzo was the king of East Lansing. And if he had come out stronger, uh, you know, about this whole situation. And Antonio, you know, again, it would have put Michigan State at least in a little better light. You, and then you, he you tried, and then there. he then he aligned himself with President Simon lockstep. Which is actually day, what he did. Days before, did. days before she retired, he mm-hmm. aligned himself with her, kind of put, him, put himself in the bunker with her, yep. which he didn't have to do. And he yep. went out of his way to praise her, and I believe in her, and – he probably shouldn't have done that, and that made him look. That didn't make him look good either. Yeah. So you you combine that with the ridiculous "I hope we got the right guy" statement, which I I, I don't know where that came from. Yeah. Um, That's what happens when you when you're not prepared. I can't believe the sports information director didn't come to him, or or lawyers for the school didn't come to him and say, "Don't say a damn thing." <laughs> Just you know, give well wishes to the to the victims of this, and that's it. Yeah. yeah, he went off. He went off uh, the reservation, so to speak. Yeah. And now look where we're at. Right. All right. So, I guess in the, uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about this as uh, as news breaks. Hell, I would not be surprised if we're talking more about this on our next podcast. But at the very least, uh, there's going to be changes at MSU. And it's going to be very painful changes at MSU, and it just, I guess, it's just another. Uh, I guess it just goes to show that uh, big time college sports are just are they're just like any other corporation or business. They protect themselves and their profits first, and that always comes before people. Hopefully, that's going to change now, but you know we'll see. All right, Greg. Before we move on to more pleasant topics, or you know if you can call the Pistons and Wings kicking the <laughs> kicking the not playing very well uh, a pleasant topic, uh, why don't you give me the the gimme, which I'll probably screw up too. <laughs> Born in 1943, he was traded to um, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs with um, uh, Floyd Smith, and um, uh, the Red Wings got Gary Unger, and they got Pete Stemkowski, and they got Frank Mahowich. They traded this gentleman along with Floyd Smith and... Um, I, I'm forgetting the sixth player. They they went to they went to Toronto. The iconic goal was scored against the Russians in 1972, which gave the uh, team Canada a tie in that wonderful eight game series. Very famous goal that. Uh, yes, I know what you're talking about. And uh, the iconic photo of him leaping yeah. for joy after scoring that goal. He is a hero in Canada. Will forever be a hero for scoring that goal. Uh, and I've also eventually played in the WHA. Uh, that's I don't know what else to tell you. No, I'm drawing a complete blank at this point. Who is it? Just tell me. Paul Henderson. Ah, okay. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Wasn't he with the Flyers at that point? No, Henderson? he was with Toronto. It was the Maple Leafs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, this is a. Uh, see what happens when I don't do the podcast for six weeks. My mind turns to mush. <laughs> oh well, I was all excited to get color. It was Norm show. Ullman. Norm Ullman was the other guy who went to Toronto. It was. It was. Yeah. It was. Okay. Uh, Henderson, Ullman, and Floyd Smith for Frank Mahovlich, Gary Unger, and Stemkowski it was a huge trade. Huge. Yeah, yeah. See, yeah. Ullman I remember more so than Henderson, at least as a as a Red Wing. Mm-hmm. So, all right. With that, let's uh, move on to uh, actual sports rather than courts. And uh, the other big topic that happened while we were uh, on our hiatus and you were laid up in the hospital at death's door uh, <laughs> was uh, uh, the uh, change at the it, in Allen Park in the Detroit Lions and that uh, general manager Bob Quinn fired head coach Jim Caldwell on Black Monday, which would be the Monday after the final Sunday of the regular season. Uh, as we talked about on our last podcast, it, it, we were it pretty much, we both declared that the wings, at the wings, since the Lions are going to miss the playoffs, odds are Jim Caldwell was going to be shown the door. That's exactly what happened. Uh, 
there were six separate interviews for the new job, including Jim Bob Cooter and Terrell Austin were getting, I think, just interviews that they could put on their resume specifically for Cooter. Uh, but there were also, uh, you know, Mike Vrabel was in the mix. Uh, Steve Wilkes, I think, from Carolina was in the mix. There was a couple of others. But I think from the get-go, everybody thought the jobs was Pat, uh, Patriots defensive coordinator Matt Patricia's to lose. Well, from all accounts, the Lions still have not uh, hired a coach. Patricia is still <laughs> doing his uh, defensive coordinating with the Patriots. But it all seems to be everything but the signature on the uh, contract is that Patricia is going to be the new Lions head coach. It really looks like he was the top candidate. It was his job to lose. Uh, reports claim, Greg, that Patricia was also the Giants' chop choice to uh, replace Bob McAdoo. But uh, the Lions won out due to Patricia's familiarity with Bob Quinn, being that they worked together for years in, uh, uh, in Boston, you know, with the new, with, uh, together with the Patriots. The fact that the Giants are going to be looking for a franchise quarterback while the Lions have one in Matt Stafford. And there was, uh, there was some talk that Patricia, if you know, looks, he looks like he would be a better fit in a non media fishbowl, which is, <laughs> if anything, that's exactly what New York City is. It is a media fishbowl. He was going to be uncomfortable with that and figured he would go with the Dungeon of Doom that is the Detroit media, or as, as Jim Caldwell used to call it. But, you know, the, the Dungeon of Doom was nothing compared to what it would be like in New York City. So. Nothing's been done just yet, Greg, but it really looks like, from all accounts, I mean, this is uh, two, three weeks ago, it was pretty much said that Patricia's going to get the job. Are you surprised the one that Caldwell was ultimately fired, and do you think Patricia's the right choice? Uh, no and yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we talked about this in December when you asked me, would, would nine wins save his job? Would 10 wins and missing the playoffs save his job. And I, I, I said for sure nine wins would not do it. Yeah. For sure. Now, I also said, you know, if they won 10 and lost out on a tiebreaker, maybe a little. I still didn't feel would have felt very comfortable with them keeping him. But for sure, nine wins. Right. Uh, and, I, and I even said to you, I said, I think they're going to lose this, the game in Cincinnati. And they did. Yep. And that's ultimately what, what sealed his fate. I th yeah, I think that, that loss alone, that, that essentially said, that was the one. I think that's when Quinn said, I need to move on. Right? Yeah, I mean, that was another, it was just another example, Al, of a must-win situation. The Lions didn't show up. They didn't show up on Thanksgiving against the Vikings, another must-win scenario. Uh, they didn't show up against the Bengals, uh, an, an inferior team who had nothing to play for. Mm -hmm. And I know the Bengals upset the Ravens at the la and knocked the Ravens out of the playoffs. I understand right. that. But the, that's not, it's still, that's, when, you're, when your season's on the line, and your essentially your job is on the line. Let's face it, uh, to, for that kind of performance, uh, you know, it just rendered that that Green Bay game, the last game of the season, completely moot. And that was the other thing. When you, then all of a sudden the the Lions just smoked the Packers and looked like they opened up the playbook. And yeah, were pulling all kinds of things out of their pockets. Where were some of these plays when they could have used them against, say, Pittsburgh a month right. before? Right. You know, like it's that. Like, uh, it's like that they passed the Stafford there. and such. You know, they, like, that those plays could have made a difference between making the playoffs or not. Yeah, and right. they it's like for a meaningless game. It's like somebody oh. found these plays in a yes. in a locked in a room somewhere. Oh, where <laughs> where, where, where have these been? Yes. But the thing about the about Patricia though is, and I I tweeted out on December twenty fourth during that Lions loss to the. Bengals, yeah. when it was apparent they were going to lose. I found a picture of Patricia, and I posted it, and I said, here's your next Lions head coach, book it. Yep. And that was on December 24th, and I was right, because that's about, exactly about who the – that's exactly two and a half weeks exactly, later, it finally became no. You're right. And it, yeah. So, um, you know, when you asked me, is he the right choice, and I said yes. Well, of course, we don't really know that. But, you know, we, we, you and I have seen so many coaches being hired in this yeah. town. But there's something about – you know, they have never really brought in a guy since, you know, really can't think of a, a you, want, you want to call, count Bobby Ross who went to the Super Bowl, Jim Caldwell went to a Super Bowl, Don McCafferty went to a Super Bowl. But when you bring in, a, a, they haven't really ever brought in somebody with this kind of pedigree who's worked right. for this kind of an organization, the Patriots, who's just, who's trademark out. Isn't mm -hmm. the trademark of the Patriots isn't that they out talent you. They don't have the greatest talent of anybody in the right. NFL. I know they've got Tom Brady. Yeah, but look at yeah, look at that it's, defense. It's the, the coaching. It's the yeah. co they out scheme you. 
They yeah, right. Game, Dan know. Shaughnessy was on, uh, I was watching him on actually the MLB Network talking about baseball, but then they asked yeah. him about the Patriots uh, mm -hmm. because it was, they had just won the, the, the conference championship. Right. And Shaughnessy said, they asked Shaughnessy, were you worried or were the F Patriots fans worried when they were down 20 to 10 in the fourth quarter to Jacksonville? And he said, not really, because he says, I've seen this, this movie over and over and over again where Bill Belichick and his staff just make these other coaches look like rubes, just yeah. completely, <laughs> you know, they smoke them. And, and, and you mentioned the scout scheming thing. It's not that they've got a bevy of, I mean, they've got good players, obviously. Yeah. But they're not. They're, they don't dominate the, the the Pro Bowl team. They don't dominate the All Pro team. Yep. What they do is they 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 adjust mid game. They adjust uh, during the course of a season. They 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 out coach. That's what it is. Yeah. It's it's about them out coaching everybody. So when you bring in a guy who's a top assistant from an organization that is known for out coaching everybody. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. It, 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 anybody can get to a Super Bowl. I mentioned Caldwell. I mentioned Bobby right. Ross. I mentioned McCafferty. And I'm not. I'm not besmirching that because that's not easy to do. But right. they've never. Lines have never brought in somebody with this kind of pedigree who, who is part of a organization that is known for outwitting you. And that's what the, the Patriots do. They outwit you. Mm -hmm. They don't overwhelm you with their incredible talent, although they have that. Yeah. It's 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 about what goes on between the between the ears, and it's about who's wearing those headsets on the sidelines. And Patricia, um, let's face it, I mean mm -hmm. he, he's got a complete buy-in. He changes things all the time. Sometimes they're three-four. <coughs> sometimes, yeah. excuse me. Sometimes they're four-three. I mean it, it's it's amazing what they do over there. So if you're going to bring in a coordinator from another team, I I don't know that you could do any better. Well, put it this way, Terrell Austin could not make a useful player out of Kyle Van Noy. Perfect example. And the Lions gave up on him. Great they example. They traded him to the Patriots. Yes. He's calling the plays on a team that's going to the Super Bowl defense, on their defense. He's got the green dot on the helmet right now. And Patricia was able to figure out the best to put, to put this guy in a position to succeed. That's exactly what's happened. Is he a great player? No. But as you said, with the Patriots, they're not a bunch of great players. They're a bunch of useful, capable players who are used in the correct way to make them the most effective. There's you know, some you, is it, it, yes. it's, it's that old phrase: the, the sum is greater than the bingo. The, the, you know, than the when you add up their parts together. I mean, that, that yes. that's just the way it, it's been for for a long time. And uh, you know, I, Tom Brady's not contrary to what a lot of people may think. He's not throwing to well, except for Gronkowski. Yeah. He's not throwing to a bunch of Pro Bowl receivers. Yeah, I mean, he, he's not. And, and I'm not saying these guys aren't any good, but they're not. He, you know, he's never had Jerry Rice. He's never had uh, Randy Moss. He's never. Well, he has had Randy Moss for a time, but he's not not in, at Randy Moss's prime. Yeah. He's not had. He's had a lot of guys like Edelman and and guys who are just Amendola. I it mean, feels not, like he's he's always thrown to a bunch of undersized slot receivers. Yes, right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. Other than when Randy Moss is there for a couple of years, but yeah, it's uh, and and Patriots going to be and for a big chase, and they're going to lose both coordinators. Uh, and then there's obviously that there's that big ESPN article about the tension between uh, Belichick, uh, Kraft, and Brady, and looks like Belichick might be losing a power struggle right now because of the Jimmy Garoppolo thing. But be that as it may, you no, know, this might be the last hurrah for this team. So. Uh, it would, you know, it's is something that, you know, as you said, you, the Lions have hired guys with Super Bowl pedigrees before, but I don't. But they did not have the X and X's and O's pedigree that Patricia brings. Let alone the fact that Patricia is heavy into uh, into metrics, into into advanced stats, and, and which she uses to put these players in the, you know, into the. Uh, right situations to make the most effective. As you said, they don't play a strict 4-3 or a 3-4. They, they, they're they all over the place, which makes them really fascinating to watch. I mean, that was at least, you know, one of the pleasures of this of this recent uh, of this recent NFL playoffs was being able to really pay attention to what Patricia was doing with that defense and how, you know, I do tend to believe that halftime adjustments are overblown. But he was constantly making in-game adjustments 
Because at, at the beginning of the Carolina, you know, after that Carolina, I mean, the Jacksonville game, it looked like they were on their way. To, there was going to be trouble. You know, after the, they scored quickly twice, but then after that, especially in the second half, Patricia was able to make the right moves and get that, and essentially shut that team down from like the, especially the second half on, you know, which allowed the uh, Patriots to make a comeback. So, uh, I, you know, and uh, let me ask you about this about the. Uh, the Belichick coaching tree, which has not been very successful. I think the most successful has been Bill O'Brien down in Houston. You know, if, uh, and But obviously there's guys like Romeo Cornell and uh, and a bunch of other guys who went to bad situ- essentially bad situations. Uh, like Eric Mangini is another one. Uh, it's interesting that if you – when the, the firing went down and, you know, as the, the – uh, the NFL writers are bound to do, they make lists. And one of the lists you would always see was, which is the best job? Almost every one of them said, with what's going on in Detroit, a team that's been in the playoffs last year, just missed this year, has a franchise quarterback, has a hot shot young GM, this was the best job to take. And that the fact that Patricia took this over, supposedly is the gold standard, uh, one of the gold standard franchises in the Giants, I think, says a lot about what he might thinks he, what he thinks he might be able to do with this team. This team is not that far, I think, from actually winning a damn playoff game. And I think it just needs another good draft, some smart personnel, and a guy who knows how to do use them correctly. Like somehow give them a running game, or uh, somehow be able to uh, make stops in the red zone that can get this team over to hump. Hopefully, Patricia's that guy. You know, as you said, you know, who the hell knows? I mean, Bill Belichick failed at his first uh, go around as head coach in Cleveland and then became the best coach of a generation. But I can understand rolling the dice on Matt Patricia. It makes perfect sense. I mean, it, it, it's all – if he didn't end up in Detroit, everyone would have, would have asked, what the hell happened, pure and simple. Well, he um, – uh, reportedly, one of the reasons he picked the Lions over yeah. the Giants was – well, we all know about his relationship with Bob Quinn, but on top of that, uh, there are those who are close to Patricia who said that he was a little jittery about making the leap to his first head coaching job in New York, the fishbowl right, fish it is New York. Right. So um, that there was that, and I think you mentioned some other things too. You look at the quarterback situation with the Giants versus the, the Lions. Yeah, Eli, uh, no, uh, Eli uh, Manning's on the. Essentially, he's got a year or two left at max, and he's been a bad quarterback for a couple of years now. Uh, and that that's seems a that, mess. That, you know? Right, it's a mess. There was a locker room that was fractured last damn year. Damn near mutiny. <laughs> What's that? A damn near mutiny. Remember when yeah. they benched Manning? Yeah. And, like the entire team went uh, mutiny just about. So, you know, that team was a mess. Yeah, and so, I, you know, he's, I, he's, you know, Patricia made his – his mind up, you know, as well, and, and he had, you know, uh, he was in a position where he could make a call like that, where, which one do I want? And obviously the relationship with Quinn and the fact that Detroit, not the Detroit's, you know, Detroit's, I mean, that's a pressure cooker too in the sense that there's been, it's been so long since there's been a championship here. But let's face it, Detroit's not New York. Nobody. He wants a playoff game to build a statue. <laughs> yeah, but right. New York is still kind of in, even though they had a down year last year, this past year, the Giants are still – they still expect Super Bowls real quick. Yeah, right. And here, like you said, if he wins a playoff game, if he hosts a playoff game, yeah, uh, he'll, he'll build a statue. But, um, you know, again, the things – the usual stuff that you can be concerned about whenever a coordinator takes a head coaching job is still going to be there. You know, how is he going to be as a head coach? Yeah. How can he – how is he going to, uh, uh, you know – take the culture that was at New England and bring it to Detroit, that's not easy to do either. I mean, we, right. we talked about, well, he makes all these adjustments and he's turned Kyle Van Noy into, a, into a, a useful piece and all this stuff. But there's also that intangible, Al, of, of we're the Patriots. Mm-hmm. And even when we're down 20 to 10 in the fourth quarter uh, yep. in an AFC championship game, there's no panic because we're the Patriots, right. and look what happened in the Super, Super Bowl last year. They were down twenty-eight to three. Yeah, we are the New England Patriots. So that means that something's good. Something good is probably going to happen if we just stick to what uh, our coaches uh, tell us to stick to. And that's 
that's what's not necessarily easily transferable from one organization to the next. Right. That's where, I think that's where, if you wanted to be a skeptic and if you wanted to be a cynic, I will grant you those feelings because when you're coming from uh, that kind of a culture where it's expected that good things are going to happen – Mm-hmm. to an organization where it's, it's expected that bad things are going to happen, right. that's where the true test will come into play. So I, as much as I feel good about this hire, it's a legitimate concern. And that would be with anybody you brought. Even if you brought Bill Belichick himself here, you'd still have the skeptics that would say, well, yeah. okay, you know, what, he, will he be lionized? Mm-hmm. So it's, it, the proof is going to be in the pudding. The only way you're going to get it over that is if somebody comes in and actually does the what has been the impossible so far, which is right. win a playoff game and, and put, make a deep playoff run, make a Super Bowl, until that happens, the, the fans have every right to be cynical yeah. and skeptical and uh, you know maybe allow themselves some cautious optimism. But, um, uh, but I just don't know that given the circumstances and given who was out there, I don't know that the Lions could have made a better hire. Right. Right. We got to talk about the Cooter in the room. <laughs> that would be one. Jim Bob Cooter. Uh, because right now, it looks like there's going to be a full house cleaning on just one side of the ball. Uh, Terrell Austin is now, uh, he was allowed to look for another job, which he did. I believe he's now in Cincinnati as their defensive coordinator. Most of the other defensive court, uh, coaches, if not all of them, have either been let go or are currently in limbo right now. <laughs> Reportedly, Patricia has already started telling guys, I, you're going to be on my staff. Uh, you know, who he's going to bring in from other other teams or maybe bring some with him from uh, from uh, New England. But on offense, there has been not nearly as much change. To this point, the only offensive personnel to move on are the offensive line coach, Ron Prince. He was fired with Caldwell, which I think says volumes, that he was let go along with the head coach because and the, the uh, offensive line, despite – high draft picks, a lot of money thrown at it, still cannot generate holes for a running game. And also uh, QB coach Brian Callahan and the Lions agreed to part ways. But supposedly, it looks like he may end up as an offensive coordinator someplace else. Uh, So right now, all uh, signs point to, specifically the beat guys, uh, Dave Burkett, uh, Justin Rogers, Carl Meineke, are all reporting that Jim Bob Cooter will return as offensive coordinator. So now the question is, do you feel like Cooter is being forced upon Patricia? And do you think you'd rather see a complete house cleaning on both sides of the ball? Because the way it's looking, the house cleaning is only going to be on one side. Yeah, you know, I don't think that Cooter is being forced down um, Matt Patricia's throat. Um, Frankly, uh, I tend to look at it the other way. If you're a brand new head coach especially when you've got your expertise on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. And you're coming into a situation where you've got a franchise quarterback who has apparently developed, uh, say what you will about Jim Bob, Bob Cooter's play, play calling at times, but the fact remains that Matthew Stafford has indeed um, built a relationship with Jim Bob Cooter that just wasn't yeah. there with any other really, any other previous offensive coordinator since Matt's been here. Right. So, you know, there's something to be said to that. I know that that may sound like I'm saying, well, the tail's wagging the dog. But when you're a new guy, you get, you're taking your first head coaching job. I, frankly, if I come in and I and I already have an offensive coordinator, now, now we don't know what kind of discussions Cooter and Patricia have had personally. Right. I mean, I'm sure they've talked on the phone. I can't imagine the, that they haven't. But, I mean, if there's a comfort level there um, and, and you've got a franchise quarterback who likes the offensive coordinator – uh, which I know I know that doesn't necessarily mean a hill of beans, but in this scenario, when you are, you know, trying, there's enough to worry about as, as a brand new head coach as it is. If right. there's somebody already in place, that you know, it's the old the old adage: if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, I don't know that the that you would necessarily just for the sake of bringing in your own guy would bring in your own guy. Uh, I mean, I so I don't necessarily look at it that way. Um, you know, I, I think if, if the, you know, if the Lions had clearly had th- their problems on the offensive side of the football, now obviously the running game is a, is a blemish on Jim Bob Cooter, there's no question about that. You can make the case that, well, hey, where's, where's the running game been? You know, he's, he's an offensive coordinator for the whole yeah. offense, not just for the passing game. 
So you can say, hey, you know, it's great that he's got a good relationship with Matt Stafford, but where's the running game? Right. And, you know, that, I mean, that, that, and that's fair. That's a fair, that's a fair uh, criticism. So, but again, if if the new guy in this case, Patricia, feels like that that that's a that's a dynamic that Cooter Stafford thing is 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 a dynamic that's worth keeping around, and we can add a running game to it. Because mm-hmm. um, frankly, that's you know the the job that's more on Bob Quinn too. Well, then, um, and you mentioned Ron Prince. You know, he was also the he held the title of associate or assistant head coach or right, something, right. in addition to offensive line coach. But yeah, you're right. That was that was a it was eye opening, but I, I don't I don't think that this is a case of Cooter being forced down Patricia's throat. I think it's just a case of if he stays, which it looks like he is, that they just want continuity uh, there. And I don't think that's a bad thing in the NFL when you've got a franchise quarterback and and you know you've got enough to worry about than bringing in a new coordinator and with new with all new stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I don't think Patricia doesn't come off as the kind of guy who would, you know, who said you know who would take an offer of being, you we want you as our head coach, but you have to take this guy with you. I don't I don't think he'd take a job like that. So I, I kind of agree have with you there. He doesn't have to. Yeah, exactly. Because he he had several other suitors specifically. Well, he's, would have to he's, up. he's young. He's yeah. he, he's not like he's in his mid fifties. He's not right. like he's been aching to be a head coach for forever. Right. It's not like he, it's not like he's seeing his window close. Mm-hmm. Uh, he could stay with the Patriots until you know he keels yep. over as far as that goes. Right. So he doesn't have. Or he to, could have been their coach in waiting. You know, yeah, because right. Belichick's not right. getting any younger. Right. You know, so so the, he has no. He doesn't have to take this Lions situation, uh, and he certainly doesn't have to take it if he feels like that uh, he can't pick his own offensive quarter. He just chooses not to, maybe. Right. And the other, uh, I think the other thing that uh, it says volumes is about the running game. Is I think when uh, Caldwell and uh, Prince are fired, I think those are the guys that Quinn is blaming the lack of a running game on. And you know, if you if we've all know about Jim Caldwell's mo, he never has a good running game ever. He's never had a good. He's never his offenses and his fingerprints were on this offense, despite you know this being Jim Bob Cooter's thing. No, it's still you know Jim Caldwell does have his say in this because you know he's an offensive guy more than a defensive guy. And his teams have never had good running games. And Quinn knows he's put a lot of money and draft picks in that offensive line. I think he's saying the reason that we don't have a running game, you two, not Cooter. You know, so now there's who knows what's going on behind the scenes. But by the moves that have been made and that there has not been a total house cleaning on offense and compared to defense, I think that uh, you can read Quinn's mind, you know. Here's where the issues were. I'm going to clean those out. I'll let Patricia make up his mind from there. But it does look like Cooter is going to get a chance to uh, improve his resume because supposedly, you know, in NFL circles, this is a guy who's a future head coach. That could also be playing into it, Greg. The Lions, maybe they don't want to lose Cooter, you know, because he is well thought of as an uh, innovative offensive mind. I mean, we saw that in the last game of the season. But, uh, uh, it, you know, I just think if Patricia is fine with this, because it's obviously if, if Cooter's coming back, it has to have Patricia's stamp of approval because, you know, the Patricia hiring, you know, this this is Quinn's probably his one real shot of getting his guy to run to implement his vision of what the team is going to be, because if this uh, hiring blows up doesn't work out, the odds are. Quinn is going to get ushered out along with Patricia. You know, we're probably talking. Well, I think he's going to sign a four or five year contract. That's usually the standard. So if this doesn't work out, I think they're both gone. So uh, because as we've now seen, uh, Martha Ford Firestone is not like her husband. Because could you picture William Clay Ford? He would no way would have fired a coach after back to back nine or seven years. No way he does this. You know, uh, hell, they probably would have got another. Uh, Carl Pop would have got another year tacked on his damn contract. Yeah. You know, so, uh, but uh, I guess, you know, to kind of tie this discussion up in a, in a nutshell when it comes to the Lions, it looks like a, a good hire, a positive hire. Lots, there's still a lot to shake out because it's not even official yet. You know, all the stuff right. that's supposedly happening in the back channels because, you know, you don't want to have tampering involved. I'm sure, there, I'm sure the agent, his agent is burning up the phone lines right now as the intermarry, but, uh I hope it works out because I like the intangibles here. You know, the fact that about, about the schemes and the X and O's and the, 
you know, the rocket scientist thing from RPI <laughs> and the, uh, and also, I hope he doesn't shave the beard. <laughs> I, I really like, the, I like that look. So, all right, Greg, with that, uh, we got to talk about uh, the Pistons and the Red Wings, what we call it tonight. Pistons are in a free fall, Greg. And is Stan Van Gundy on the hot seat? Not that you would ever know because Tom Gores <laughs> has really become kind of your typical absentee owner. You know, who knows what the hell he's thinking at this point. But when we last talked, the Pistons were starting to fade a little bit, but they were still 17-13. They were fifth overall in the East. And looking like, even if they faded a little bit, they were still going to make the playoffs. Well, here we are. Uh, six weeks later, they've lost point guard Brady Jackson to a grade three ankle sprain, which that's, that's the worst possible sprain because that means he tore a ligament in his ankle. And as things look, he may not be back for at least two or three weeks. It very, very likely it's going to be longer because at, with the time of the injury, they said it would be six to eight weeks and he would be reevaluated. It's only been five. So odds are he's going to be gone who knows how long. So right now we have a team without a true starting point guard. We have a team that's struggling to run the offense. Uh, this, this team has now dropped to 22 and 25. Actually, 22 and 26 because they lost today. Uh, they've lost eight in a row. They're ninth overall in the East, obviously. So, which means the playoffs started, the, the Pistons would miss again, and yet they would be stuck in that no man's land of, of you're, you're just going to miss the playoffs, but you're <laughs> not going to get an impact lottery pick. They're back on that treadmill again. Yes, there has been some bad luck here, you know, specifically the injury to uh, Reggie Jackson. But he is what he is. He's not a elite point guard. He's an average point guard. But we saw how much he means to this team. And there are at least 500, I think, if he's here. But I think, uh, at least myself, I bought into that small sample size that we saw at the beginning of the year, you know, with uh, specifically of Avery Bradley. Because if you look at his numbers over the past couple of months, he has been awful. Uh, you know, shooting around less, I think, 30% from three. His true shooting percentage is, around, is under 50%. Uh, he's now, he's family injury, which has always been one of his bugaboos, is that he can't play a full season. He missed today's game, for example, with a, a lucky hamstring. And there's all talk that maybe Bradley uh, is going to get traded because he does not look like a guy who's going to be worth even uh, – Contavious Caldwell Pope money the way he's playing here in Detroit. And Luke Kennard looks like I'd give him his minutes. You know, he, he's not playing him right now. <laughs> so here we are. The Pistons are once again caught on that mediocrity treadmill. And right now the fan base is lost patience with Stan Van Gundy. SVG is in the crosshairs. But the thing is, he's still got a year left on his contract. And who the hell knows what Tom Gore is thinking because he's out in L.A. So... Right now, I still think SVG should get another year just because of the bad luck of Reggie Jackson. But if he decides to keep Avery Bradley, if he doesn't somehow get something for him to trade it, like he should at least get you a low first-round pick because they already got guys who can replace his production, specifically in Luke Kennard. If he doesn't trade uh, Bradley or, or find some sort of way to start rebuilding this roster, which even with – Andre uh, Drummond played like an all-star. He was probably should have made the all-star team. Despite that, they're under 500 and dropping. So if he can't just figure out this Bradley thing and get this roster turned around, so because they're maxed out cap-wise and are still under 500. If he can't get this figured out, I, I'm going to lose what little benefit of doubt I, I have left in Stan Van Gundy. You know, um, it's, it's almost like when they made the playoffs in 2016, that was like the worst thing yeah. that could happen to them. I don't, which I w would never have thought. I thought it was the exact opposite. I thought that making the playoffs that year we both did. was finally, um, you know, it was Stan's second full season, and we thought, yeah. well, geez, now they're on the path. They're they're trending upward. What, what's what's happened though, Al, is that you know you mentioned Reggie Jackson, and you know it's amazing how much they rely on him. I mean, the, the, yeah. the Pistons are, I think, 3-12 and 12 yeah. since he went and down. he's not that good of a player. Yet. Well, I mean, you know, he's for what for, for he the is Pistons. He is what he is. is. Yeah. For he the is Pistons, he, he obviously for the Pistons, he's very valuable because yeah. the, every time he goes down, they struggle. And, 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 and every time. is that this guy has hit a history, much like Bradley, of ha having trouble staying healthy, even though the ankle thing was a bit of a fluke. And they don't have you know, a capable 
replacement, I mean, for any sort of sustainability. But the thing about the Pistons is that they just, first of all, Stan has not handled the finance. He's not built the roster very. There's no flexibility left. He not. He has not done a very good job with uh, finances, with yeah. uh, getting the best bang for the buck. He's made some curious moves that have been uh, penny wise and pound foolish in some regards, and 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 and, and he just has not created a. He's not. He's not. He hasn't helped himself as a coach by the way he's built the roster. And the other thing too, Al, is that the what makes this team so maddening is they just for this has been going on for so long now, nine ten years of being yeah. soft mentally, yeah. just soft mentally. They're just they don't have they don't handle any sort of adversity well at all. They don't. They're you know you mentioned the the small sample size when they started out fourteen and six. Yep. Got some really big wins early. Obviously, they went out to out west. They beat the Warriors in Golden State, and right. they, they beat Houston. They beat they beat some really good teams early. Mm-hmm. And you know, Avery Bradley was looking like you know a great pickup, even though his contract situation was 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 uh, something to keep an eye on. And I, I, they just for whatever reason just don't seem to be able to handle any sort of adversity whatsoever. Uh, they don't have that 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 mental toughness that we've seen here, both of the bad boys era and in the in the going to work era, right. where they were just mentally tough, and they just mentally they've been mental midgets for ten years here, <laughs> yeah. and it, it doesn't take a lot to put them off kilter. And and that we, we were talking about earlier when we were, when we were talking about the Patriots, and about the the culture of what right. of, we're the Patriots and. Something good is going to happen because we're the Patriots. And the Pistons are fighting that as well. They're fighting 10 years of being lost in the NBA wilderness. It's a, Really, when you think about it, Al, it's amazing yeah. that in the NBA, especially in the East, that you can be lost in the wilderness for 10 years in the NBA without being never getting a lottery pick, never making the playoffs, yeah. never... Never, you know, I mean, not winning a playoff game in ten years. Right. It's amazing that you can actually do that. That you can you can actually do that. I I, I find that fascinating in this league, that you can at least I, one that the one of two things haven't happened in ten years that they've gotten haven't gotten a lottery pick, and they haven't made a, and they won a playoff game. I, I, how you can do both? How you can not get a lottery pick and not win a playoff game in ten years is almost impossible yeah especially yeah. especially in the east yeah. I, so and you mentioned that treadmill which is like you said it seems like that they're, that's where they're going again ninth overall and fr- frankly if they were to write the ship in these last 34 games and sneak in here again sneak in right. the playoffs the eighth or seventh or eighth seed they're not gonna do anything yeah i get knocked they're gonna get the swept Celtics again or, or something yeah they're gonna get swept again yeah and, 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 it's you know and you mentioned earlier what about Stan Van Gundy? You know, the, the, first of all, the fan base. I don't. I think again, it's they're they're fighting apathy again here. Yep. I knew that moving downtown wasn't going to be the panacea. I said it, it, it's going to be okay if they <laughs> actually win. Yeah. But they're not, you know they're not winning, and the, the, there's I, I you know I don't know. And you mentioned the absentee ownership of Tom Gores. I know he's got a good relationship. Or at least we think he does. Yeah. With, with Stan. But, you know, we're talking now, look at where the Pistons were in 2014 when they brought Stan in right. and where they are now. I'm not talking about the roster. I'm talking about where right, the, about the franchise is. Yeah. And are they are they appreciably better than they were four years ago? they're almost the same. You know, they're, they're you know, I, I don't a 30-some-win think so. win team. You know, he's, he's, he's been here four years, possibly will have missed the playoffs in three of them. And... Not gotten a lottery pick. Not done yeah, anything it, with the it, roster that has it, been. And be capped out salary cap wise. Hasn't with, there's uh, so many general managers Al in the NBA yeah. that are so much smarter than he is. Danny Ainge in Boston is a great example. Yeah. It's amazing what Ainge does over there. Um, yeah. There's so many NBA executives who know their way around a salary cap and know that the think ahead. Yeah. They're always thinking two or three moves ahead, and that's what you have to do with, with in a league that's got a hard cap. You got to think about. 
contracts expiring. You got to think about it's like a chess match. Yeah, and, and he is Stan is getting completely, uh, you know, he, completely out foxed by these other G- GMs around the NBA. He's making, and it's become a league wide. And I'm not going to say that's a league wide joke, but it's become a league wide concern that the way that he has handled the roster and the finances and the and the positions he's put himself in and the, and the Pistons in, which is not with any sort of forethought or or or, or uh, yeah. uh, setting up for success, is becoming an issue around the league. And he's he's not this model of being the president and the coach. If if you're going to use the Pistons as the poster boy for that, that's not going to that's not doing any favors to any other organizations that might consider this this uh, model. Yeah. It was an experiment worth trying, you know, because Van Gundy yeah. did have a, has an excellent reputation, but it's not working out. Right. You know, it's, so it's so far, and this is, you know, this year it looks like it's going to be another lost season. They said we're back in that uh, mid-teens draft pick range way it's looking if they don't get <laughs> things turned around. And I don't see how they could, you know, because I think the only way they could probably end up making the playoffs is if they trade for a starting point guard which essentially means giving up a number one draft pick or give you know you know you know what every team is asking for we're all asking well yeah we'll give you what you want but you gotta give us Luke Kennard you know and a and a number one pick there goes your future right there to make a kid a number eight seed this year and but he cannot do that even if you know you know he's probably on the hot seat at least with the fan base if he starts making these win now decisions to to max out like 42, 43 wins. <laughs> that's just uh, putting, that's your nails in the coffin because the next few years are going to be ugly. Cause, and, cause you know, it's stay and do something, just do something, but don't sell the future. I'm just afraid that's what he's going to do. All right. Before we wrap it up, Greg, we got to touch on the wings. Are they sellers? Yes. Do they have things? Do they have players that teams want? Other than Mike Green, I don't know. That's the question. Right now, we're at the All-Star break. The All-Star game was actually today, Greg. Uh, the Wings had one person there, Mike Green. He is on the last year of his contract. And if he's still here after the trade deadline, I will eat my headphones. So, you know, please trade him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there are 11 points and four teams back of the wild card and 15 points behind third place Toronto and Atlantic. So the vision's gone. There, there's no way to get a, a sneak into the third place. And the way things look, the wild card is already long gone. Ken Holland has all but admitted they're open open to dealing any and everyone who is not named Larkin, Mantha, or Appa to see you, um, or draft picks, things like that. You know, uh, but other than Mike Green, who who is going to get traded, you know, and likely for at least a, a decent draft pick, are there buyers who want the Wings to sell? Like, what do they got to sell, Greg? They got uh, one of the goalies. You know, you take your pick of Jimmy Howard, who was old and expensive, or uh, or uh, Morazic, who Peter Morazic, who was young, expensive, and not played very well. Uh, and after that, you got a bunch of forwards who uh, who are too old, too expensive, and have no trade clauses. You know, such as the Nielsens and the Afanasios of the world. And so. Once you get past Mike Green and maybe a goalie, who the hell are you going to trade? Because uh, Holland has painted himself in this corner with these heavy contracts, worse off, with the no trade clause. <laughs> I mean, Green's got a no trade clause, but the guy's going to want to play the playoffs, so he'll likely waive it. But I don't see how who is going to be able to trade. He's going to have to start thinking about some of the core, such as Tatar and, uh, and Nyquist and guys like that, you know, who were once thought to be the future of the team, but are now just essentially shown to be role players. Even though those guys aren't cheap either and under contract for a while. So I don't know how what the Wings are going to do with this trade deadline. It's like, we're open for business. I just got to wonder if anybody's going to show up at the door. Well, this is another situation where Ken Holland hasn't put, hasn't set the, the organization up for success. Yeah, He hasn't. Uh, the forethought, the, the everybody saw this time coming except him. It seems like, and I don't know if it was because he was in denial, or he just didn't have the wherewithal to to deal with this. But you know, there are so many players, Al, that that could have been 
bargaining chips two or three yeah. years ago. Yep. The Nyquists of the world, the Tatars of the world. Had a lot more value back then. Right, but are just useless now. They're absolutely yep. useless now. And and, and and then you're giving out con big contracts to the Luke Len Dennings of the world. Yes. And that big contract that he that he gave to Justin Applicator, which, in all fairness, I supported at the time. I mean, I, I, all transparency, I, I was all for that contract. I thought that Applicator was somebody that they needed to lock up. That he's completely problem, gone. I had no problem with these deals. They were all just a year or two too long. That's the and, issue. And 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 so now you've got again, like we were talking about with the Pistons, you're in that you're in that no man's land, which is where you hate where you just can't be. You just don't want to be in any sport where you're not terrible enough to be um, to get a great a, a real high draft pick, but yet you're you're constantly four or five teams behind a playoff spot and you're yep. chasing some ridiculous playoff dream. And, um, and I think Kenny's just going through the motions right now. There, there's every indication he's not been uh, talking to Chris Illich about his future with the Red Wings. There's rumors that he's maybe going, uh, uh, might, might be going out west of Seattle, yep. uh, that he's um, – uh, not going to be with the Red, Red Wings organization after this year anyway. Right. So there's really – everybody's just kind of going through the motions right now. Uh, you mentioned being sellers, and, you know, that's that's kind of funny too because, like you said, who are you going to sell? You mentioned the goaltending situation. That's another maddening thing about this team as well is that the, each of these guys, Howard and Mrazek, just when you think one of them has kind of established himself as the number one guy – they fall flat on their face. And then the other guy plays well for five or six games, and he looks like he's the number one guy, and then he falls on his face. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 or then, and then a guy will come come out and, and, and pitch a shutout and look like, you know, uh, Trechiak, and then you think that he's finally figured it out. Yeah. And, you know, Jimmy Howard's 34, he's, or he's going to be 34 if he isn't already. Yep. Uh, Mraz is going to be 26, and he's still, got, I mean, he's still young, of course. But there just hasn't been – the goaltending has not been – it's not, you know, the old adage about if you've got two quarterbacks, it means you have none. Right. It's kind of the same situation here. It's nice to think that you've got two reliable goalies, Al, but you really don't. Yeah. You've got two guys who take turns being reliable. Yeah. And that's not the same thing as having two reliable goalies. Yeah. And so what Jeff Blaschel's doing is, he, it, it, it's all, which is all he can do, is play the hot hand and, and, and wait until that guy falls on his face, and he will. Uh -huh. And then you go to the other guy until he falls on his face. So there's that's not that's not the recipe for success either. And then there's a contract situation going on there too with the goalie situation. And you know, I, I, it's it's just this is not tenable either. And yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, all this is doing, Al, is just it's just post it's just making this whole process that we knew was coming longer. Yeah. And uh, I don't know I don't know what you think, but I I don't see the Red Wings being a force. And then HL for at least three or four more years, uh, so and that's most only if contracts start to fall off. Pretty fall simple. off, and 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 the and the Bertuzzi's of the world and guys like that truly take over the mantle, yeah. and and truly, you know, uh, become the next wave of, of of stars. There's some, there is some hope. There are I mean, there are some good players coming up through the ranks, um, but yeah, like you said, Bertuzzi looks like a keeper. No, yeah. there's the the three you're likely going to build around. Larkin is go likely going to be a, at the very least a number one center in the league the way he's playing right now. So there's building blocks here, you know. But the problem is they need more of these building blocks to come up. But why, you know, like they brought up Joe Hicketts for a game, yeah. sent him back down. Uh, Don McTurgeon brought him up for a game, sent him back down. Yet they're right. still playing David Booth, Luke Witkowski. Right. You know, yeah. and and they're not going anywhere. There's no reason to be playing these. Early thirties role players who right. you could easily wave because no one's going to pick them up. Right. You know, it's and and you now you got me terrified because we have a general manager who's going through the motions, essentially running out his time on his contract, and he's going to be in charge of the trade deadline. <laughs> who well, knows what the hell he's going to do? Yeah, and 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 compare that with when Dave Dombrowski was on his way out the door and he engineered Brilliant some fa some fantastic trades yes. at the trade deadline and I think it was 2015 yes the 15th literally trade out deadline. the literally on his way out the door yep. and 
you know, he, he's by those trades, he's actually helped set the Red Wings, oh, the, Red Wings the, the Tigers up for some success right. down the line. It, was, it wasn't, you know, it, it didn't completely change the complexion of the organization, but it, it, it did. It, it, they weren't trades made normally by a guy out the, with right, his, exactly. on his way to the door. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to see how this all plays out. Oh, God. It's going to be a rough, uh, rough rest of the winter around here, Greg, to say the very least. And we haven't even touched on the Tigers. <laughs> or, well, they had Tiger Fest this weekend. At the very least, uh, Ron Gardenhire, at the very least, I think is going to keep things fun and interesting, If not, but the team's not going to be very good. Because he's, do, he's, saying, he's doing and saying all the right things. But I think well, he'll, he'll probably have a different tone when it's June and there are already 10, 15 games under 500. But still. Okay, so it's, it's, it's time to uh, – I'm getting tired because I'm not used to podcasting anymore. So, <laughs> so uh, let's get our jerk of the week out of the way, and then we'll call it a night. So who's your jerk? Well, you know, of course, we just had the Baseball Hall of Fame vote uh, last yes. week. And, of course, what comes with that are always going to be lots of debates, and, that, and that's part of the fun of it. But I, I, I'm just – you know, Al, I'm just stunned yeah. at the lack of love that has been given Jeff Kent – I don't know what, what – I know Jeff Kent wasn't Mr. Lovable. I understand that. He was not uh, Dale Carnegie when he played. I understand yeah. that. But he was – he hit the most home runs of any second baseman in the big league history. Now, you could take that for what it's worth. But right. he was a he, – he was an MVP. He should have won another MVP in 2000. They gave it to Bonds. Yeah. He was a, a wonderful, wonderful player, very productive. Um, you know, they say, well, he wasn't a great defender. Well, I – I don't know that his, how much his defense, over or lack thereof, overshadowed what he did on the offensive right. standpoint. And he's he's sitting at like 14, 15 percent after all these years. I, I you know it's the whole Lou Whitaker thing. I don't know what yep. the you can debate all you want whether you think Jeff Kent is a Hall of Famer, but you can't. I don't know how you can look at 14 percent and say that's a fair representation of his of his career. And I, I, this has been going on for, for a – he never got a lot of love from, from the voters, never. Yep. And then Omar Vizquel, his first year on the ballot this year, got 37%, which is very good for a first-timer, especially somebody who had no stick hardly to speak of. Right. And he's trying, to, he's trying to go in as the second coming of Ozzie Smith. Won MVPs and was a key cog in in big time teams yep. uh, in in L A and San Francisco and the Mets is disregarded essentially. So I my jerk of the week are the the voters who I just don't know yet they'll give ten votes to guys like Jamie Moyer. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, no kidding. Good lord, we could do an entire episode of just bitching about the BBWAA and the Hall of Fame vote. Uh, there are so many good players out there right now who are stuck in limbo. Uh, the whole system really needs to be updated and changed. They're, they're, they need to have a bigger ballot. There, there just needs to be some changes made. You know, uh, We could go on for an hour naming off players who should still be in consideration. And don't get me going to Lou Whitaker, for example. So Or Ted Simmons or Bill Freehand. Or, I can just go on. So I'm with you there. All right. My jerk of the week, I'm going, to, I'm going to touch back on the MSU thing, essentially on a couple of fan bases, that being uh, obviously MSU and Michigan. Because when stuff like this happens, things get ugly in, in several different ways. You have such as uh, you'll have part, there's a vocal minority in the MSU fan base who thinks they can do no wrong and think ESPN has it out for us. And uh, Tom, uh, Tom Izzo is my idol. He can't do anything wrong. Which is, you know, that, that makes no sense to me. Then, or you'll have them say, well, they do it too. That's my favorite. Well, Baylor did it. Michigan probably does it. You know, essentially trying to deflect blame or, and things like that. Or then you'll have fans with Michigan saying, ha ha, essentially being Nelson on the Simpsons, pointing at them, saying, ha ha, look at you guys. Uh, you, know, you know, we're not being implicated in anything, completely forgetting some of the crap that Michigan has done, such as the. Uh, Remember Brandon Gibbons, who uh, the kicker for Michigan, when uh, yeah. what was there, and the the team lied as to why he was suspended. Essentially, uh, yeah. Brady Hope didn't want to tell anybody that it was a sexual assault. He has said he was out for family reasons. You know, people right. conveniently forget this kind of stuff, and I guess it really comes down to. 
I hate the us versus them thing when it comes to college fan bases or fan bases in general, but it's worse in college. And yeah, for the most part, on both fan bases, they're like, you know, we want to see we're, we want to see everything fixed, and we want to see people get the. Uh, we want to see everything fixed and, and no one get hurt and everything be taken care of. Yet there's still these little pockets of the fan bases that are so rabid, are so us versus them, that their administration, their coaches can do no wrong, even if they're breaking the law. I mean, we saw it with Penn State. There's still Joe Paterno apologists there. And Ohio State with uh, with uh, Trussell. Trussell, exactly, and that was peanuts compared. Yeah. The Trussell thing with uh, with uh, Tattoo Gate was peanuts compared to what happened at Penn State or Baylor or Michigan right. State or whatever. But I guess my jerk of the week are college fan bases who wear rose colored glasses when it comes to their school and refuse to admit that there are things wrong there, that maybe they're heroes. So that's another whole discussion, how a basketball or football coach can be your hero and idol, you know, right. uh, or Michigan who has essentially lionized Bo Schembechler, which you know, not ever won anything. Uh, but the fan bases who could, with, with the worry, there, if, in this case, green and white colored glasses who think their school can do no wrong, yeah, things need to change. So, and, and for that matter, the media that plays it up and plays it against it, specifically if you listen to sports talk radio. So that's my jerk of the week, Greg. College fan bases are exhausting right now because they won't admit to the obvious. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, thank uh, Paul Sweeney from StadiumJourney.com for joining us t- this evening. A uh, wonderful discussion. Check out that website, StadiumJourney.com. It's fascinating. Um, you know, even if you have never been to a lot of these venues and just want to just out of curiosity, see what, what uh, yes. Paul's writers have said about them. Or what's fun as well is to go to click on uh, venues where you have been to see if your opinion of those venues jibe with uh, with what Paul's folks uh, say. That's kind of fun as well. Exactly. So thanks. <clears throat> Paul, thanks Are you dying for, again? Are we going to have to call I, As I'm trying podcast? to get through, this, <laughs> get through this podcast, I apologize for the coughing on occasion. Um Check us out in two weeks from tonight, uh, February the 11th is the date. We will be – that will be our posts. We'll be talking, I'm sure, about the Super Bowl. We'll be talking about the Matt Patricia press conference, I'm sure. Lots of things we'll be talking about. Hopefully spring some training. trades as well. Spring training will be on, its, on, yes. on the doorstep at that point. So lots to talk about on the 11th of February. Uh, join us uh, two weeks from tonight. Uh, Al will tell you how to get to the podcast. Uh, follow me on uh, on Twitter, at Greg Eno. Follow the Knee Jerks on Twitter, at the Knee Jerks. And our Facebook fan page is facebook.com slash the We also have a knee group on Facebook as well. Um, and uh, read me at Out of Bounds, my Out of Bounds blog, and uh, the Wing Wheeler, both on WordPress. And Al's going to tell you how you can get a hold of the podcast. I have to think about it for a second. Oh, yeah, okay, I remember that. <laughs> All right, of course, we're on the, uh, the Mothership Blog Talk Radio, uh, blogtalkradio.com. Just search for the knee jerks or, of course, use. Uh, the kneejerks.net will take you to our Blog Talk radio page where you'll find all the podcasts and the uh, archive. As well, we are on iTunes. Again, search The Knee Jerks, Eno and Big Al for our entire podcast archive. And, of course, we are streaming on Stitcher Radio, which is available on pretty much every device available uh, when it comes to iOS, Android, and on uh, the computer desktop. Again, just search for The Knee Jerks, Eno and Big Al, and click on subscribe when it comes to any of those sites and, of course, as Greg mentioned, you can find us on Twitter and on Facebook and along with our own website, thedayjerks.us, which I have to remember to renew because I just got the email the other day. So, <laughs> all right. With that, I think that about covers it. So hopefully the next podcast will be shorter as well because we'll have uh, less less th- less and more controver- less controversial things to talk about. So until this time two weeks from tonight, this is Al Beaton saying good evening, good luck, and aloha. Ciao, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Good night.